Hey, good morning, everybody. It is good to be here. I um, just want to welcome you all to Freedom Church and those that are joining with us online today. Uh, we just had a great time over at Freedom North in uh, the north part of the city, our other campus over there. Uh, just uh, God's doing awesome things over there too. Encourage you to check out sometime. It's at uh, nine o'clock in the morning, a little bit earlier. If you're an early bird, you might want to check out over there as well. But uh, just an awesome time together in the presence of the Lord this morning. Uh, before we do anything, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I just want to ask God's blessing upon the Word of God today. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much, God, just for meeting with us here today. God, we acknowledge you. You above everything else going on in our life. You above, God, all the trials that we might be walking through. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we don't have to walk through this life alone. We thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just ask that you just anoint the word of God this morning. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, you open up our human hearts, God, as we're just receptive to you today. And ask God that you still work in us, God, so that you can do a work through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. If you would, turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to get there in just a moment. Um, I do want to give a, a quick shout out to those that, uh, that uh, supported the Lockport Cares Ministry, our homeless uh, ministry right here in town on yesterday's event for the coldest night of the year. We had an awesome team go out and support that. So uh, let's just give it up for, for Freedom Church representing Joy, I think, somewhere around here. And she kind of led that team just with a blessing to, to see uh, them be a part of that, and I'm uh, just excited to see what God's doing in all of us together collectively. Um, I've got a quick question for you guys. Uh, have you ever seen that label on your coffee cup? There's nothing in it, by the way, just so you know, I'm not going to spill it on me right now. But ever seen that label on a coffee cup that says, caution, caution, contents hot? Anybody see one of those on your coffee cups? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like one of those things maybe that you've scratched your head at before and thought maybe it's a little bit ridiculous that, that, that they put this label on this coffee cup, right? Um, why, why, why would I need that? Of course what's going to be in there is going to be hot. And if it's not hot, I'm going to go right back into the restaurant and demand a new cup of coffee. No, I'm just kidding. I would never do that. I'm not that kind of guy. But, but still, you know what I'm saying? It should be hot in there, right? And why would you have to label the cup? contents hot. Well, 1994, the lack of a label cost McDonald's almost $3 million for that lack of a label. There was a 79-year-old lady by the name of Stella Liebeck who was parked in McDonald's parking lot with her grandson. They were getting breakfast that morning. They kind of stopped in the parking lot afterwards to, to fill up their coffee cup with creamer and sugars and all that kind of stuff. And as she was doing that, she kind of had the, the coffee between her knees and she was about to pour things in there and she spilled her coffee all over her lap. And here's the thing. She actually suffered third-degree burns from this hot coffee. She actually had to have skin grafts done. And so she actually had taken uh, McDonald's, she, she filed a grievance and asked for $20,000 to cover her medical costs and McDonald's offered $800 for it. And so for that, she ended up taking them to, to court. And I'm not trying to say whether that's right or wrong and what's right and just and all that kind of stuff, but this is just the story. And so she did that, and um, the judge actually awarded her $200,000, but then took 20% off because he said, well, you're, you're, you're a little bit responsible too, right? And so from there, the jury, though, decided, you know what, that's not enough. McDonald's needs to, 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 to offer two whole days of, of coffee profits. And so almost $3 million they awarded her. Now later on, they, they kind of backscaled on that a bit too, but that number kind of is, is the number that people associate with that experience of why we've got labels on our coffee cups. 
But from that, we, we find that actually car companies now make sure that they put coffee holders or cup holders in the vehicles for people. Now, now every car comes with them, right? Restaurants, they've also reduced the heating rate because McDonald's, I mean, their, their heat rate was 180 degrees Fahrenheit. That was well over many other places in terms of how hot that coffee was. But everyone's putting a label on the coffee cup, just like this. Well, as we've been walking through the Gospel of John, Grandpa, Grandpa John, Papa John, whatever you want to call him, the Apostle, he gives us a warning label here in, in, in 1 John chapter 2. And he says that there's something that your faith has to watch out or you're going to be burned by this. And it's the wrong kind of love that he addresses here in what we're about to read. Let's read together. Verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Wow. Now, it might seem a bit unnecessary, but just like this coffee label on the coffee cup, John is giving us another warning. If not heated, this will burn you in your life. And he's warning you about the love of the world or the wrong kind of love. John is telling us, don't touch the stove here, kids. Don't spill the coffee. Don't love the world, the love of the world and the love of the Father cannot coexist in your life. It can't. John points this out clearly like the hot label on the coffee cup because we have a tendency to deceive ourselves into thinking we can live with both of these kinds of loves, but we can't. It's an impossibility to the divine cosmetics of what love actually is. John tells us in chapter 4 that the source of love is God himself. God is love. As we study who God is, we understand what love is. Just like that famous passage in 1 Corinthians 13, we often say love is patient, love is kind. Well, if you just kind of take the love out there and you put God in, that's a description of God. God is patient. God is kind. He's not rude. He's not irritable or insistent on his own way. God is not resentful. God rejoices with the truth. God believes all things for your life. He hopes all things, endures all things for your life. God never fails. Love and God are synonymous, according to John the Apostle. God is the source of love. To understand God, you have to understand what real love is. And you don't learn what real love is from this world that we live in. We easily get so caught in this idea that love is a feeling that we have. <laughs> but real love in its origin was never predicated on a feeling. It was based on the will. God's will chose to love you and to love me. That's why he created us. That's why he sustained us. That's why he saves us. Romans 5, 8 says that God shows his love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was while we were in our sin. God didn't have some wonderful feelings for us when we're in the midst of our sin. He's not, oh my goodness, I just love you so much, even though you're stealing and you're lying and you're doing all these terrible things. That's not the picture that we get of God. He chose to love us first. Love originates in the will. And so love for the world system, a system that's dying and decaying and deceive, deceive, deceiving you, cannot coexist in the heart of man with the love of the Father. Just cannot. Now you might be wondering, well, well didn't God create the world? And doesn't it say that, 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 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? It most certainly does. God does love the world in the sense of humankind and his creation. There's different types of the world in the scripture. Okay? And this idea that John is getting at 
is the system of the world. The world is the invisible spiritual system that arranges itself against Jesus Christ. That's what John is talking about here. The love of the world, a system that arranges itself, that lives in rebellion against God. Not only is it the system of the world that is ruled by Satan and his forces of darkness, but it also is comprised of man's selfish desires and willful disobedience to God himself. In essence, Jesus threatens our self-centeredness. And so this world lives in stark contrast to a holy God. It lives in rebellion to God. We live dead and separated from Christ, as it says in Ephesians 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. There's a spiritual influence that is ever working to persuade you, to persuade me from the Father's heart towards us. The world is ever working this way. That, that's, why, that's why we see it pronounced in the world, of which we should not even be surprised with. That's why we see things like, like that song, Unholy, that's being, that was celebrated at the Grammys with the show of a, a satanic seance and sacrifice. It's the world doing what the world does, living in rebellion to a holy God. As Christians, we should not be surprised. The world lives in rebellion to God. But God still loves each man, each woman, and each child, and that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. The world system continues to operate in defiance to God's rule. That's why even in these days we're seeing countries like Sri Lanka, Myanmar, along with other Central Asian countries following after China's leadership. We, we see governments starting to establish themselves in ways that actually oppose God. You see, with the promise of growth and prosperity, these countries are beginning to walk down greater authoritarian paths that they rule by force those who oppose their efforts, especially Christians who call for the respecting of human rights and free participation in civil society. Those, those ideas, they actually come from the Word of God, by the way. But it's not just the big bad world that's out there. I've heard plenty of people talk about the world as in it's this thing out there. You know, but what about what about the world in here? What about Christians who are living with the love for the world? Maybe hearts that are bent on the love of money. Maybe who live in disobedience to their parents with ingratitude, heartlessness, those who are lover of pleasures rather than lovers of God. That's worldliness too. It's not just all the big bad stuff out there. We could have just as much worldliness in our own hearts and minds. James rebukes his hearers in James 4. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Basically, if we're, if we're bouncing with the world, if we're rolling up with the worldly system, we're saying, no, God, I'm really against you. You can't love the world and the Father. It's like that beautifully written song. Well, I love her, but I love to fish. Come on, you know the Brad Paisley song, Gone Fishing, right? It's a story of a guy how he's conflicted between the love he has for a girl and the love that he had for fishing, right? It's a, it's a funny song, but so, so ridiculous. It's just like this idea of the love of the world and the love of the Father. The two just don't compare. The love of the Father is so much greater than the love of the world. Listen, if you have never seen the great northern lights in the sky then you'd be satisfied with neon lights on the road. If you've never heard the crashing of the ocean's waves, then you'd be just fine listening to talk radio. 
If you've never taken in a scene from the top of a mountain and looking at memes all day on your phone could satisfy and gratify you for a bit. But listen, if you knew the love of the Father and how much greater it is than anything that this world that we live in can offer you through his son, Jesus Christ. If you only knew that you are the apple of your father's eye, if you only knew that you are forever secured in the the hand of your father, if you ever knew that, that he cares for your every tear, your every toil, your every hurt, and your every trial, if you ever knew how much he has in store for you, then no other love that this world could offer you would ever take you, would ever take your gaze away from him. Listen, the world contends with God in your life. I mean, it's a boxing match. It's in the boxing arena, in the ring. It vies for that place in your heart. It tries to lure you away from the love of the Father. It pulls you to its side and tries to convince you that what it has to offer is better than what God has to offer. It tries to busy your time and your, your mind and your heart. It takes you over. It consumes you. It tries to get you to love the world more than God himself. The world does everything it can to contend with God's love and God's will for your life. Listen, the church is called to be in the world, but not of the world. The church is called to be in the world, but the world must not be in the church. Listen, as a pastor, I've heard many, many different opinions over the years, complaints, sometimes accusations against the, the quote-unquote church. And, and I try to help people, point people to Christ even through those things. But you know what I never hear in any of the complaints that I've heard as a pastor? I never hear anyone ever taking responsibility for themselves. The finger is always pointed at others or this greater idea of the church. But if you're a believer, you are the church. I never hear anybody say, I'm living too worldly. I'm going to take responsibility here and get right before God. I need to repent. I need to humble myself. Instead, it's always somebody else. It's always directed at the church, other people. What about you? What about your heart before God? What about what about what God wants to change in your life? Has anybody maybe been touched just by what's going on in, at Asbury University? Pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome, and, and I love how that started. Some people are calling it a revival. I think history will tell us that, so we got to wait to maybe call it fully that, but it's certainly an outpouring of what God's doing right now. It's awesome. But how it started was that there was just a simple confession of sin. I think there's about 20 students after a chapel service or something like that. It wasn't, it wasn't this this big, powerful expression of God. It wasn't all this huge faith and all these signs and wonders. It was just simply somebody saying, I'm going to confess right now before God. I'm going to step into the light of things that I've been hiding in the darkness. They didn't demand God do this or that. They, They didn't try to make it happen. They just simply said, God, I'm confessing that I've been living worldly. Please hear me out. Revival has become a term that's often used for spiritual experiences. But real revival is actually birthed in repentance and it's carried over into missions. It's the invasion of God's presence and his power. It's undeniable and man cannot fake it until he makes it. Revival is more than just a movement of God. A lot of times as the church, we can sometimes parse those terms and we can mess that up a little bit because we think revival is just God doing something great maybe in a service, but it's got to be so much bigger than that. It has to be where the community around it is completely affected about the outpouring of God's presence and power. It goes beyond the church and spreads out to those that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
One of my favorite revivals in history happened to be in the Scottish islands of the Hebrides in the early 1950s. You know how that started? There was two sisters, one who was 84 and one who was 82. And they prayed. They saw on their islands that there was no young people coming to church. All the young people were running after the world. And they began to pray and ask God. And God started to do some amazing things. There was a minister by the name of Duncan Campbell, no relation of mine, but he was instrumental in preaching during this time. And he describes scenes of Hundreds of young people crowding the local parishes one night after they were all at a, at, a dance, at a dance hall. And God's convicting power just came on them and they all flocked to the churches. He'd walk out at 4 a.m. in the morning and people would be littered along the roadside under the powerful hand of God, praying, confessing, crying out for God's mercy. He described how the, the entire community was transformed by the power of God. It was more than uh, an evangelistic crusade, more than a good service where the church was blessed, but the community was changed. He wrote, a God sent revival is always a revival of holiness. It takes the supernatural to break the bonds of the natural. You can make a community mission conscious. You can make a community helps conscious. But only God can make a con community God conscious. Just think about what would happen if God came to any community in power. I believe that day is coming, he wrote. May God prepare us all for it. Amen. Come on. Maybe it's now. Maybe this outpouring will be a revival that transforms our nation. I certainly am praying that it begins to impact the world, the worldliness of the world. I'm praying that lost people will come to know Jesus Christ and saved people will live lives of holiness yet again. But please, no real revival, real revival will mess your life up. I'm convinced that a lot of people that are Christians don't really want real revival because, man, it'll change. It'll change your standard of life. It'll change how you're living. Your time will not be yours anymore. God will be consuming your life. I love that this outpouring in Kentucky is coming to a, a Wesleyan holiness denomination. They know that revival is more than, than just, just the power of God, but yet there's something that has to happen in the human heart you can't manufacture the manifestation of the Spirit of God, but you can consecrate yourself apart from the world to receive what God is going to pour out in your life. But the pull of the world will contend with the love of the Father. The pull of the world, the love of the world also corrupts the Christian. It's like Novocaine. Have you ever had a shot of Novocaine put in your gum because the dentist is going to take out your tooth? Listen, we just started this past week on our first, first of, of five in getting into the orthodontist for braces. Man, let me just say, see my savings go goodbye. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Lord, if any time there is a miracle I need, it's now. <laughs> but listen, Novocaine desensitizes you from the pain of what's going on in there. And that's what the love of the world actually does to the believer as well. It desensitizes you from the love of the Father and the will of the Father. It also desensitizes your life to sin and ungodly living, meaning that, that you're, you're more apt to entertain that. Jesus says it's not the food that goes in that defiles a person, but what proceeds from the heart of man. And this... This is where our enemy preys on us. Satan has used these three tactics from the beginning of the world. We find them in the Garden of Eden when he tempted Eve and the forbidden fruit. We find them in Achan when he coveted the, the devoted items after the fall of Jericho. We find, we find Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, taking, taking the stuff from the world when, when Elisha wanted nothing to do with it. The list goes on. Jesus was tempted with these things. We find it over and over again. We find these three tactics. The first is the desire of the flesh. 
Listen, we all have desires, and desires aren't inherently all wrong or all bad. I have a desire for some food. I'm hungry right now. I want some lunch. Stop preaching then, right? No, I'm just... <laughs> I'm hungry, but that's a desire that I have. But yes, guess what? When it pushes the boundaries and when I'm, I'm, I'm living just to gorge my flesh, I'm being overindulgent, right? That, that then becomes a problem. That's the desires of the flesh. When we take the desires and we go way beyond God's bounds for our lives, that could be in food, that could be in relationships, that could be in sex, that could be all of those different things. The next one is, is the desires of the eyes. The desires of the eyes, it's what's attractive. It's what's shiny. It's shiny. What, what, what attracts your eyes in this life? What you're pulled toward, what you want to have, what you want to look like, what you want to get, all of that. It's what lulls you, what pulls you, what draws you to that. Last is the pride of life. It's the me-centered approach where now you become self-sufficient in your own mind and you don't rely on, on God anymore. You don't rely on God anymore. It's like these different things are, 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 like, are like virtual reality goggles. Has anybody ever used those before? They're pretty fun. I'm gonna encourage you to go do that sometime, or I'm not gonna lie. That's just fun. It's cool. I mean, you got these goggles on and you're doing all these amazing things and, 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 but you know what? You put your hands out and you can't touch any of the things that your eyes are seeing from you because it's not real. You know, we as a society, we're kind of getting into this, this whole idea of virtual reality. More than that, there's, there's a new thing called augmented reality. It's called AR. And these are, 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 these are basically... Things that, that make us be, look different than we really are. It happens a lot on social media. It's funny, man, when I, when I was a kid, you just accepted the fact that you were ugly. But now, you know, you can put all these filters on, on yourself, you know, in your online profile. <laughs> Both Facebook and Instagram claim that over 600 million people use these beautifiers. Facebook has 10,000 employees working on augmented and virtual reality right now. More than 400,000 third-party creators have produced over 1.2 million effects for Facebook alone. And then what it has done is it's augmented our reality. It makes us look, uh, it makes us more enticing to the human eye. Krista Crotty, a specialist on eating disorders and mental health, is sounding the alarm. The sense of anxiety that young girls are, are having on their online profiles. Even young guys. We're seeing this not just shaped in their, their, their pictures, but now this generation's whole identity is being shaped by things like augmented reality. It's not healthy. It's not real. And that's what the love of the world does. It augments your reality. It's, it's virtual reality. It's not real, friends. The love of the world does one more thing. It contradicts God's will for your life as well. Paul says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. The patterns of this world live in contradictions to the, God's patterns of your life. See, when we start getting pulled to the things of this world, we start stepping outside the will of God for your life. And guess what? The will of God, John says, is the only thing that abides forever. And so guess what? We, we actually start going after meaningless things when we start going after the things of this world because John says it's passing away. The world has a funeral date set for it by God himself. It's going to end. He's going to make all things new. Worldliness leads to worthlessness because ultimately you're never going to find any meaning in this world and what this world has to offer you. You won't. There's no meaning in it. There's a, a, um, a scientific magazine called The New Scientist that, that recently in the last few years asked several philosophical questions and gave scientific answers to, to these philosophical questions. One question was, what is the meaning of life? And the author, he, he took a stab at, at answering this question. He said, the harsh answer is that 
has none. Your life may feel like a big deal to you, but it's actually a random blip of matter and energy in an uncaring and an impersonal universe. When it ends, a few people will remember you for a while, but they will die too. Even if you make the history books, your contribution will soon be forgotten. Humans will go extinct. Earth and the sun will be destroyed. Eventually the universe itself will end against this appalling reality. How could a human life have any real meaning? That's the world system viewpoint. You know, we give a lot of love to those things in pursuit of the world. But man, I'm not sure this world really loves you back. I'm not sure this world really cares about you. Not only that, not only does worldliness lead to worthlessness, the wrong kind of love, the love for the world, leads to the wrong kind of beliefs. John goes on in this passage, and he wants to instruct the church, and this is so relevant for today. I don't want you to dip out here. I'm going to give you five quick principles through this, this text, okay? And, and we're going we're to close it up. But five things, because John says, listen, if you start to love, the, if you've got the wrong love in your life, there's going to produce some wrong beliefs in how you see things. You're going to collect some beliefs that are not from God. And John does not want you, he does not want me to live in error. He doesn't want us to walk in error. He wants us to walk in truth. He wants us to walk in light. He wants us to walk in love. That's the, the whole book that we've been reading. So it says, John tells us, children, it's the last hour. And as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For they had, if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. Just pause there real quickly. You see, what was happening in this period of time in the church of Ephesus was there was a, a split. Okay, but it wasn't a, a, just a kind of a normal church split where two people just disagreed or two sides disagreed over doctrine. It certainly was a doctrinal split, but the one group, they were actually heretical in their beliefs. They didn't believe that Jesus was really the Christ. They believed that he wasn't really real. There was, there was a different belief, and so they were actually espousing heretical viewpoints. And John is here saying, listen, you, you got to get back. This is, this, I want you to stay grounded in the truth of God's word here. And so when John addresses, listen, the Antichrist, that spirit is in the world. There's many Antichrists. An Antichrist spirit could be anybody that opposes Christ. And, and, and certainly we see that in the world. And he talks about it being the last hour. Listen, the last hour in Scripture is any time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. All right, so we're still living in it right now. So it still applies for you. It still applies for me. Verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Listen, this group of people that were coming against the, the early church here, they were trying to convince them that they didn't have all of the, 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 the best knowledge. So John is addressing and saying, no, you've got the Holy One. You've got the Holy Spirit. You're anointed. You've got the truth. You've got all the knowledge that you need in Jesus. It's nothing more than him. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. See, they were trying to differentiate between Jesus and God. And guess what? Jesus is God. We don't differentiate between the two because he is God. Verse 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. 
But the anointing that you received from Christ abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as this anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it is taught you, abide in him. Little children, abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Listen, how do you know that you're born of God? Well, your behavior starts to change. You start to practice the righteousness of God because he transforms your life. And because you love God, and because you love God, you, you, you want to you start learning his ways. And when you start learning his ways, you start to walk his ways. And you start to live righteously. And God does this work in partnership with you saying, God, I'm being a vessel here. I want to walk. I want to practice righteousness in my life. There's a lot of people that claim the right beliefs, but they're not practicing the right behaviors. Listen, there's so much out there in the world these days. There's a lot of claims to, 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 to what's right and, and, and my beliefs and, and my truth and my tolerance and all of these different things. And guess what? Every couple of years, the fad changes and they're on to something new. John's saying, abide in Christ. You have Christ. You don't need anything new. You've got him all. You've got all that you need for life and godliness in him. You don't need to pursue every, every wave and every doctrinal teaching. You don't need to go after this teaching and that teaching. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. We want to learn. We want to grow and all that. But sometimes I feel like even the church, even in our pursuit of knowledge, it's worldly. Because we're trying to grab all this stuff, but it's not working in our lives. The reason that he gives us knowledge, and it's not just intellectual knowledge, it's in knowing him, it's in experiencing him, it's in being revealed, it's him being revealed to us. That's the knowledge that, that John is talking about, and that needs to work out of our lives so that we're practicing righteousness. Pursuing the world leads to polluting the truth. And listen, there, there's five things that John wants us to, to make sure that we're not polluting, that we're not polluting our faith, and that we're walking in truth and not in error. The first one is, is, is that we develop Christ-like fellowship with other believers. That's what we've been talking about. It is so important to be established and rooted and grounded and built up, to spur one another on to love and good deeds, to encourage one another, to correct one another when we're going off in the faith. Can I get an amen? amen. Who needs a little correction once in a while in their life? We all do. We all do. Right? We need this kind of fellowship. That's the church. That's what Christ has called us to be. And guess what? I get it. There's plenty that, that has gone wrong in, in the quote-unquote church, but yet we're still around. The church is still growing all throughout the world. People are still getting saved and coming to Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. God's going to build his church. The next one that, that, that he establishes here is be accountable to godly authority in your life. Here's the scratch, the head scratch for y'all. John was an original. He was an OG disciple. He walked with Jesus. And yet this new group of heretical teachers were trying to pull the church away from an OG, somebody that actually had some authority to talk about Jesus Christ where none of these people did. They never experienced him in the flesh. They never walked with him. They never talked with him. John did. And John is trying to establish, listen, listen to me and my little children. Don't go here. Don't go there. Don't get off on that. Don't, don't pursue those different things. Abide in Christ. Get back to the sound teaching that Jesus gave to us. You don't need more than that. 
And I also get it too. Listen, I completely understand. Every other day, I, I, you turn around and I'll see some minister falling away from God. Somebody, somebody that was in leadership doing something they shouldn't be doing. And, and I get it. I understand. I'm sure in this room there's been plenty of experiences that you, that you have had some, some maybe some tough times with godly leadership in your life. I understand that. Completely do. But you know what? God still establishes authority in our lives. You gotta be accountable to that authority. Hebrews says, hey, make sure that you're, you're, you're actually helping out the leaders in your life that they, they, because they're watching over your soul. Listen, I gotta give an account to God for how I pastored you and shepherded you. That brings some holy fear in my life because I don't wanna do this a miss. I want to be a good steward. I want, I want to be a good shepherd. I want to be a good, good spiritual father in that way. Because I've got one person that i got to answer to, and that's Jesus Christ. The next one that John brings us through is that we judge by the fruit and not by the feelings. Jesus says in, in Matthew 15, you will know them by their fruit. There's a lot of things that we, people are just so often just, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that, I'm passionate about this, I'm passionate about that. And you know what, those can be okay. I'm not saying they're inherently wrong or evil or bad, but you have to judge, you have to discern by fruit, not by feeling. Man, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said, I feel like God is, and you might be right, maybe God is doing that but let's judge it by the fruit afterwards. And fruit takes a little bit of time to develop. He goes on. John also gives us the principle to examine the scriptures, not people's interpretations of them. I feel in this day and age in the American church, we have, we have everything at our fingertips when it comes to biblical teaching. We got everybody's interpretations of what the Bible says, yet is the church in the Bible? Or are we just listening to what everybody's communicating about the Bible? Finally, John talks about an anointing. He talks about how we have the Holy Spirit. And in there he says, he says you've got the anointing, you don't need to be taught by anybody. I've heard this misinterpreted so many times. I've heard it in kind of defiance. I've got the Holy Spirit. I don't need anybody to teach me. That's not what John's saying. You can't dismiss the rest of the New Testament because there's many teachers in the New Testament. You can't do that. What he's saying here is that you have the Holy Spirit so he will help you discern. He will help you to test the spirits behind what anybody's trying to tell you, what anybody's trying to teach you. This group of people were trying to teach them contrary to things of God. John's saying, no, no, you have the spirit of God. You don't need anybody to teach you anything differently of what Jesus has taught. But here's the thing. We're called to honor the Holy Spirit. Honor him. His first name's holy. His first name's holy. Do we honor the Holy Spirit in our lives? Or do we just make him an experience, a feeling? Do we make him an it or a force? The Holy Spirit is God himself. He's part of the triune God being. He is God manifested to the church here on earth today. And we're called to honor him. To honor him. The world will take us down pathways that dishonor God. The world will bring us down pathways that corrupt our hearts and corrupt our minds. Will we be that people that say, you know what, God, 
I'm going to take responsibility to stop walking worldly. I'm going to repent. I'm going to start to pursue holiness again in my own life. Not expect everybody else to do that. But I'm going to own this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this before you today, God. You want revival? Well, it can't be lived out with a love for the world. You want revival? It has to start with holiness. Setting yourself apart for God. And that means choosing to walk in His ways. Not man's, not the world's, not error of the scriptures. God's calling you and he's calling me to pursue holiness in this day because he's coming back for a church, for a bride without spot or wrinkle, a pure bride. I don't want to shrink back. I want to have confidence when he comes, ready for Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. That's what he wants to do in this generation, in this day. But it starts with you. Will you consecrate yourself in holiness before God? Will you? Church, right now, I'm just going to simply ask as you just push other things away, the worldly pursuits, the worldly timetables, that right now you just make an altar before the Lord in your heart. I'm going to encourage you to f come to this altar and just lay out before the Lord. Just kneel down before God. I'll start. But church, it starts with the people who are ready to pursue holiness. Will you do that today? I invite you to join me up here at the altar.